There comes a time in the development of every family when the children begin to ask questions. And one of the questions that can be looked forward to with some apprehension is the inevitable one, where did I come from? The family braces for this, and according to its own insight and its estimation of the intelligence of the child, attempts to explain the origin of life. First of all, of course, the child is asked, where did I come from? This is always overlooked, for there is no ready and available answer. The parents, if they are modern and feel that they cannot expose their children to legendary, uh, attempt a simple statement of biology. Uh, the best they can possibly hope to accomplish with or without the aid of the birds and the bees is a description of some kind relative to the origin of the physical body of that child. Because the youngster has no particular point in mind when he asks the question, usually merely interested in larger generalities, uh, the child does not normally question further. He accepts an answer that is obviously inadequate because he has no way of estimating adequacy. The matter then rests for a time and may not be brought up again for 50 or 60 years. The information that has been provided is regarded as gospel, and later various courses in school and college support this position. But our remote ancestors, back in the days when they were trying to orient themselves in this universe in which we live, were a little more thoughtful and a little more idealistic in their approach to this large issue. In order to understand where we come from, we have to find out where the world came from. We have to understand the entire process of creation itself. For only against the background of a great universal law or pattern can the development of individual forms of life be properly considered. From the most ancient times, therefore, we may say that concepts concerning the origin of things, the origin of existence itself, divided into two general patterns. These patterns have descended to us in philosophy, religion, science, and we are still clinging to some aspect of this ancient thinking, although we have attempted to enlarge and deepen our understanding. There are only two ways in which you can answer the question of first cause. One is to take the attitude that there was a beginning of some kind. No matter how you try to work with this situation, it is embarrassing. Uh, if, for example, you imagine the child asking questions to be a little older and a little wiser, and you tell that child that he came from his parents. Then the next question would be, where did the parents come from? They came from their parents. And so on by regression to an inevitable point of uncertainty. Where did the primordial original first parents come from? This question is still not answered. And uh, is not likely to be, except by further uh, regression of thinking. Some scientists might point out that we came from the anthropoids. Then the question is, where did the anthropoids come from? Then we can go back through all the different forms of life to a monocellular organism sometime in the dawn of things. But we are still burdened with the question, where did that come from? Therefore, all questions concerning beginning uh, have to be approached non-logically. You cannot possibly 
uh, develop a, a logical sequence that will include the origin of first cause. The uh, theological approach to this in several different areas has been to assume that creation was created by a divine being. This is probably the ultimate theological regression. It is as far back as even the most pious-minded can think. We must then assume that apart from creation, there was a creator, and that for some reason, at a certain time, long ago, or not so long ago, according to the denomination you belong to, uh, this creator caused by his own will or by the verbum, the speaking of the ineffable word, uh, to uh, cause the world to come forth. Here we have then a creator separate from creation, ordaining it, creating it, fashioning it, uh, dominating, governing, and ruling it, and planning its progress over a period of time. Obviously, this pattern nearly always includes an ultimate dissolution of this world. It returns at some infinite time in the future to the unknowable being from which it came. We seem to have a rather neat package here, except for one difficulty. Where did God come from? What was the nature of this being? Uh, was this being ever existing? The only answer that seems to be possible is, therefore, that it was ever existing. For it is almost inconceivable to man to imagine God growing up from a small child. Uh, we are confronted then with deity as an unknowable value, an in inevitable and ultimate uh, value beyond which we cannot go. What uh, constitutes the nature of the divine? What is the basic power of the divine consciousness? Uh, theologians do not like to discuss. It gets to be too complicated, and we are not in the presence of any satisfactory uh, formal knowledge which can withstand the debates of opposing opinions. The second theory or, uh, or philosophy that has been fashioned simply, frankly, assumes that what, li what we might term the infinite essence or infinite nature of things is by its own quality and principle eternal. That everything that exists is in essence eternal. And that what we call creation is merely a manifestation, a conditioned existence arising within an eternal nature. According to this concept, creation is not the result of the dictum of an arbitrary or separate deity. Creation is a manifestation of principles that are inherent within existence itself, existence being eternal and inevitable. Uh, this attitude, this conviction, I think held most of the better minds of the past, that at the beginning root or substance of all conditioned existence as we can imagine it, whether of human beings, or of suns, or of solar systems, or of galaxies, or of cosmic chains, even of space itself. At the root and source of all of this is essence, an unconditioned nature of itself, capable of manifesting condition, but always containing within its own ineffable principle all that can be manifested from it. Thus we may say, that existence moves into the production of existences, and these existences return again to existence, which continues. Uh, it was interesting to realize that some rather ancient peoples, along before the benefits of knowledge as we have them today, were able to conceive of this total existence, to conceive that it transcended time. The time was merely an expression of it that it transcended space. Space was only a manifestation of it. And that there exists somewhere, everywhere, 
in the innermost and outermost parts of all things and in all the intervals between the innermost and the outermost one indivisible essence one indivisible being and that this continuing forever is the base material the earth in which creation grows and that creation itself is merely a continuing process in which the potentials of this infinite existence uh, are gradually transformed into potencies or manifestations. Today I believe the tendency is to assume this general concept. In the uh, development of this concept, of course, many systems of philosophy lost sight of the idea of an ultimate deity. They lost sight of the concept of one conscious being at the source of life. Rather, they thought of an eternal being, all conscious, always. And that consciousness as we know it is as much a conditioned state of universal consciousness as bodies as we know them are conditioned state of, states of universal substance. Uh, this uh, general attitude uh, seemed to provide the best foundation for the creation of a philosophic system. For systems have to be born just as beings are born, out of a primary conviction. And the primary conviction becomes the essence of that doctrine or that philosophy, which merely expands and extends it. We may term the primary conviction a premise or an hypothesis, but upon it must be built all uh, that follows after it in terms of the detailed explanation of the processes of creation. Out of the general opinion and uh, substance of many ancient systems, we can gain a certain basic idea of the uh, beginnings of human thought in these matters. In both East and West, in the most ancient cultural concepts, we find, therefore, that, so to say, in the beginning or from the beginning or however we want to call it, throughout eternity, from that which has no beginning or end as we know it, but beginning now in the sense of fundamental, basic, uh, that which is the source of all else, that in this kind of a beginning there was an infinite essence infinitely diversified, spreading through all time and space as a great principle of life. That this life principle transformed what might be termed vacuum into a dynamic space area or field. This field is limitless, eternal, inevitable. And it extends not only beyond the stars as we see them, but beyond all creations of all kinds, beyond even our imagination. This is one potency, one tremendous dynamic. And this dynamic is invisible to us, beyond our comprehension, has no form or shadow by which we can see it, and in its natural and inevitable state is not even imaginable by us. Consequently, we cannot define this nature. We can only accept uh, in terms of thoughts or in terms of words that there is this unconditioned eternal and that in some mysterious way this is the cause that existence as we know it can exist. That existence can exist only because life exists and life itself is one of the basic manifestations of space, of eternity, and it causes from its own nature all the living things that are dependent upon life for their existence. So we can neither consider the ancient writings of the Zohar, the Kabbalah of the early Jews, or the ancient Vedic writings and, the, and particularly the Puranas of the Hindus, or the Yigin, the classic of change, the ancient book of China, or any one of many other uh, early records. They all seemingly 
have admitted the same essential principle, that there was an eternity, and that this eternity is the principle which peoples and nations have gradually come to identify as God. God, therefore, is primarily abstractly the mysterious unity of eternal life. Uh, deity is the one that permeates all. It is the one undifferentiated. It is that which is one in sense of total unity. And from this inevitable and ineffable source, all things originate. Now this would cause naturally a consideration of what the Gnosis and the Kabbalists call the doctrine of emanations. Here we have something that goes on like a great ocean, a Dao in China. Here is the great sea, the inevitable. Uh, we watch it in our mind's eye because we cannot see it. But we can imagine it as though it were a vast ocean extending through all eternity. And it is quiet, and it seems to be unmoved. And yet somewhere in the apparently transparent depths of it, uh, there have to be things, seeds, lives, principles, energies, essences. And these are capable of coming forth uh, out of this uh, procedure under certain conditions. We then come to the problem of conditions. And this again forces us back into the idea of how it all started. How did this eternal potential uh, suddenly uh, dynamically come to generate? How did this sea, which is forever itself, suddenly cause something to arise within it, which seems to be a diminution of itself? Uh, two principles are involved in the solution to this. The first is uh, that this vast ocean of potential was also forever creating, that the process of creation is as eternal as the principle itself. Therefore, no matter how far you want to go back in your imagination, the creating process was already in operation. There was no time when this wheel suddenly started to turn. It has always turned. For what we might regard as this first impulse, the first movement of things, is an eternal movement, first again in quality rather than in time. Consequently, uh, space or eternity or essence was forever producing from itself production being a, an essential part of its eternal nature the other point of view is uh, that this God concept produced an infinite descent or generation of beings divine beings who use space as the raw material for the creation of universes and cosmic systems uh, created by their will and purpose. And that this chain of descending beings is also eternal. That it never began and it never will end. But that there is in this space itself, as part of its own nature, an eternal descent of creators. That part of space's own structure is creative consciousness, which manifests automatically and continuously forever. Well, for people who did not know anything about our modern thinking in astronomy and physics and all these subjects, this was pretty profound uh, reasoning. But as uh, we study it more carefully, we begin to appreciate some of the validity of this pattern. Uh, that uh, universes come and go, worlds are fashioned as men are fashioned, and disappear again as men disappear. But as the passing of the individual has no uh, permanent effect upon the unfoldment of humanity as a collective, so the passing of a thousand solar systems has no effect upon the eternal movement or eternal unfoldment in space itself. For space is ever begetting ever producing and gradually the forms which it engenders disappear back again in their fatigue or exhaustion into the principles which created them. 
In the Indian philosophy, we have an interesting sidelight on this point. For in the Indian thinking, uh, creation is not only this continuous production, but it is dominated by a law of periodicity. Uh, the so-called creating powers do not create continuously. Uh, they create for a certain length of time, and then the creating principle and all of its productions fade again into a kind of sleep, which in India is called a pralaya. In this particular uh, concept of things, uh, the idea is uh, that the life of a creating deity is also measured in time. Uh, this time is infinitely greater than anything that we can imagine. The life of one of these creative deities may extend into hundreds of billions of human years. Yet this being in some way emerged, not by the process of growing up as we know it, but by a parallel or equivalent process, a process of unfolding. Growth in terms as we term the word implies the release of potential, the gradual unfolding of a state of maturity. This also in another dimension, but in the same essential principle, uh, accounts for the emergence of deities. The deities come forth not from nothing, but from the previousness of themselves. They awaken, as we might say, from sleep. And uh, the intervals between the great creative cycles of a deity are referred to as intervals of sleep. And the manifestation of this deity is referred to as a day of manifestation. And the retiring of this deity into non-manifestation is called a night or a period of sleep. These together are referred to as the days and nights of Brahma. Now, in this particular pattern, of course, we are referring only to a deity. And it makes no difference whether this deity is the ruler of a solar system or the creator of a vast uh, galaxy. Uh, all the time, deities, uh, as expressions of the infinite, are coming into manifestation, awaking from the sleep of ages, or as one of the ancient books says, rousing themselves from the seven nights of rest so that there are seven cycles of rest and seven days of manifestation symbolically to make up the life of the creating power in the in emerging therefore uh, this deity takes the place perhaps of some other that is fading into sleep and as there are millions and hundreds of millions of these systems in space in all different degrees of growth, maturity, and decline. Uh, space itself continues to be forever inhabited by creations, just as the earth is continually inhabited by creatures, although none of these creatures has a continuous existence as far as we can see or tell. This is a pretty large concept, but uh, is almost certainly the best that we know at the present time. So to summarize the point as far as we have gone, we can simply say uh, that space itself is like an infinite universe of existences, and that the stars and the great constellations and the great orders of life uh, are like hosts of beings inhabiting space, subject to all the laws which in a small way man is subject to but still like man having this mysterious power of perpetuating the great purpose of life, although as an individual he cannot perpetuate himself physically indefinitely any more than a solar system can. All stars and planets and solar systems and galaxies must in time fade away, but as they fade others will take their places and the continual process will be unbroken. In this same thinking also, those that fade away do not surely or truly die. Man may fade away as far as his manifestations are concerned. His body disappears. And in the case of the universe, the great 
luminary, the great sun in the center of a solar system may gradually burn out. But this does not mean that the sun dies. It merely means that it retires from an objective to a subjective state again in this great ebb and flow of the tides of life. For in the processes of creation, there must always be this duality of motion, uh, the two motions recognized by Lao Tzu. There must be the outflowing motion and the returning motion, as in the case of the movements of tides. Now this involves then a concept of where these various deities came from in their own eternal existence. Here we then have another chain of patterns which belong to part of the concept of eternality itself. Life is an infinite progression of patterns. Life is an infinite unfoldment of infinite potential. No one can say or even imagine what the total potential of existence is. But it is assumed in philosophy of the idealistic nature that this potential, like the theological assumption of God, is infinite. Therefore, all forms of growth that ever have been are part of it. All forms of growth that now are are part of it. All forms of growth that can ever possibly come into manifestation are part of it. Uh, thus, uh, what we would term the unfoldment of things is an infinite progression of growths, uh, very much like a cycle of many embodiments of man, for here the ancients also made use of the concept of rebirth. Uh, that rebirth itself is an infinite process of a kind, and that this process is a continual unfoldment of life. Thus, uh, in this universal concept, there is not only the continuance of these beings, but the unfoldment of their potential. Uh, thus, in time, all of these beings evolve, and even what we might term the great powers creating cosmic systems are still growing and must continue to grow. This growth began at some remote time and under some remote condition which we cannot even imagine. This growth in the end leads beyond any imaginable or conceivable state, but this does not mean that it actually ends. It is quite possible that growth finally passes to the point where there is no longer any galaxy, any physical form as we know it to represent the unfolding of a divine agent. But this simply means that as far as we are concerned, the process of growth passes beyond our conception, and therefore we assume that it ends. We assume that when the galaxy dies, it dies. But this is no more a truthful assumption than the idea that when man dies, he is dead. We are only able to estimate a certain narrow visible area of growth, but this growth itself goes on and on and on. And it also came from a mysterious source. Now, uh, philosophers and mystics faced with this enormous sense of condition uh, also had certain uh, hesitation within themselves. Uh, they did not actually know how to handle the idea of anything being so completely infinite and at the same time finite. They could assume that perhaps the most advanced deities uh, imaginable in space, even the twelve great gods of Miru themselves, could have begun at some incredibly remote time to grow up as man has done, as tiny organisms upon a tiny planet somewhere. That they too may have been atoms and electrons. That they may have been minute forms of life, infinitely less than we can imagine even like the lives that make up our own body, which we cannot really estimate. Somewhere, sometime, they may have started with an extreme humbleness of things, and go on and on and on, growing, 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 until perhaps they go past the growth of planets and suns and galaxies, and perhaps become uh, infinitely, incredibly impressive or magnificent, uh, so vast we can no longer even imagine them. 
This uh, is all right up to a point, but it certainly ultimately gives the individual uh, not only a sense of inferiority, but a tremendous headache. It is impossible to estimate in m mental terms this infinite, inevitable, eternal growth without again falling into the same dilemma that all things that grow must have grown from something and grow to something. And the infinite process of, mo of movement from lesser to greater uh, provides us with so vast a landscape that it is hard to even conceive it. Supposing we say, for example, that every cell in man's body will ultimately unfold and become as great as the largest galaxy in the heavens. Um, there is no, nothing to prove that this could not be true. In fact, there is much more uh, to indicate the possibility that it is true than the assumption that we merely go down into the dust and remain there. Yet even if this is all true, uh, growth going on beyond imaginables and incredibles seems to present us with the possibility that somewhere, sometime, there will be such an incredible amassment of these vast things uh, that even space might be exhausted by them. Uh, there, is, uh, there is the same problem as was theologically expressed in early Christendom as whether or not the invisible universe was large enough to take care of the souls of the dead because the souls of the dead are so greatly outnumbering the living and from all living things forever something pours out into the invisible is there any possibility that the invisible will ultimately become full and as this now involves an added dimension of enlargement qualitatively and quantitatively the situation that evolution presents is almost as difficult an infinite condition an ultimate in which all things are infinite becomes rather a big problem the uh, philosophical people therefore uh, came to the conclusion that at some point or some time things fulfill their archetypes that in fulfilling their archetype, for example, in the case of a creation, that the archetype of the creation is the being that created it, and that any, be any evolution or process of growth within the area of this being ultimately caused the parts to become equal to the whole. Each creature became identical with the creating power that fashioned it. And in Indian philosophy, when this identity is reached, uh, the creation becomes identical with the creator. The creature and the creator have no longer any interval between them, and the part sinks back again to become one with the totality. That somewhere then, in the infinite of things, all divided parts are reunited in their own cause. Thus, uh, in the very last of everything, it is the deity of the creation that evolves. And this evolution is caused by the growth of the parts of itself. And when the parts of itself have completed their own growth, then the power, the central power, has attained its maturity. And these parts become part of its own completeness, like the cells of the body become part of the completeness of man, and are no longer distinguishable from the total purpose of man himself. This was a good, and as good an answer as we may likely find. And uh, with that, we have to be content uh, for the moment. Uh, the uh, Indians, East Indians, uh, studying the situation, therefore, uh, reduce the matter from an infinite number of creations to which it is the same truth is applicable to the selection of one, perhaps in this particular case, a comparatively small and unimportant creation, which we call a solar system. A solar system is a pattern, it is a design, it is a form, uh, a, an archetype, a resident forever in the divine nature. In other words, space in all of its parts is archetypal. All things grow according to patterns. All life carries pattern intrinsic within itself. Thus a life unfolding or evolving does not become a helter-skelter mass of animations. It becomes an organism, a structure, a thing in which there are limits upon all manifestations of activity, 
these limitations making possible the gradual emergence of a specific form of life. Uh, we can't imagine what would happen if the life of carrots suddenly became beets, or if the life of man suddenly changed into an animal. Uh, these things are inconceivable, and uh, there is no example of their ever occurring. This is because each life impulse carries within itself the pattern of its own unfoldment and its own development. It is forever fulfilling a pattern. It is growing up into a likeness that is eternally its own. As in the case of the flowers of the field, there may be millions of a certain type of flower, but they will all grow up into the likeness of the pattern, which is their proper natures. So that uh, when the time comes, for example, for a solar system to manifest, the archetype of this solar system rests in the consciousness of its creating power, uh, which in turn is only one of this great mass of evolving creative powers resident in the eternal essence itself. This power has existed before, has manifested before, has created before, but it has passed into the rest which exists between the great cosmic processes. So for a while the area of a solar system, uh, or where a solar system is to arise, remains placid, quiet. There is no evidence whatsoever of activity or animation within this area set aside. Then, as the ancient said, uh, a motion or an activity begins. This activity is very much like the impregnation of a seed or the beginning of the growth of the baby chick in the egg. There comes a time when, uh, to use an old term, the space involved in this process uh, curdles, that uh, activity arises within its own essence. This activity uh, being the re-emergence of a creating power. This re-emergence is extremely gradual and takes place uh, over a vast period of time, millions and millions of years. But gradually, and uh, according to the laws within itself, there emerges from this space, from this area set aside, the beginning of an organized existence. And in Indian philosophy, the concept is that in the beginning, at the very start of things, uh, what was termed the egg was fashioned. Now this egg is also found in the writings of the Gnosis of Alexandria. It is the Orphic egg of Greece. It is the mysterious Druidic egg. And of course, it is the world egg of the Hindus. Now the egg is used to symbolize this simply because man has no way of devising a better analogy. It is only a symbol. When we think of the cosmic egg, we are not thinking of the same kind you buy in a store. You are thinking, however, of a process arising in nature. Uh, that what we call this process has to do with the gradual arising of a fertile condition, a condition in which uh, situations are taking place by means of which the evolution of a universe uh, is possible. According to the beginning of the ancient system, at the very commencement of this great process in which the deity who is to be a solar system is awaking from the seven nights of rest, sleeping like Vishnu upon the coils of the, of the seven coils of the serpent of eternity. When the time comes for this to happen, uh, the consciousness of this being, in the Hindu might be likened to Brahma, or in the Kabbalah would be likened to Ain, the boundless, uh, or in the uh, Gnostic theory might be considered uh, El de Boaz, Lord of the Aeons, in the Nordic, All Father. When the uh, time comes for the manifestation of this, the fiat, or creative word, consists of an energy or a ray descending from the consciousness of the being, and this ray striking the mysterious 
albuminous substance of space spreads through it, fecundates it, and sets it aside for the creation of a world. This might then be uh, likened to the fact that it is the first step in the incarnation of a being into a body or a form. Uh, in the uh, Greek system, uh, the incarnation was the result of this ray causing the primary division of the two natures or ultimate conditions of space itself. Space was therefore regarded as potentially capable of sustaining two conditions, a point that was also made by Pythagoras. These two conditions become the beginning of polarization, and polarization is the beginning of creation. Creation and polarization are both the beginnings of division. And as Pythagoras also said, division is the beginning of death. Consequently, embodiment, the creation moving from its eternal suspension into objectification by its first movement determines its own end. In other words, the moment uh, the duality appears, the division of homogeneous existence into a polarized condition. The moment this occurs, the disintegration of this compound becomes inevitable. Two is the beginning of compound, and all compound is mortal. Therefore, all compound must be dissolved, as we find inscribed on the monument of Lord Bacon uh, at St. Albans. This division, the Greeks called ether and chaos, uh, it represented the division primarily of that part of existence set aside for a pattern of creation and that part which was not set aside. Uh, we have in this cosmic system always to remember also that in another place in space other universes were in various degrees of unfoldment. We are only referring now to the uh, beginning of a particular solar system. Others already exist, others will exist, some are disappearing but now one is coming into birth. And in this coming into birth, uh, there is what the ancients call striving. And all existence, all life, is called the son of striving. And striving represents polarity operating upon itself. And in the uh, Gnostic and in the Greek, the action of the two principles, ether and chaos, on each other, uh, produce a, um, a motion. This motion is a whirlwind, a great turning of two currents, one affecting the other. It is like the inevitable force and the immovable object. Uh, these contrasts create motion, and motion is the beginning of creation as we know it. In the uh, ancient Nordic uh, Edas, we find, for example, that in the beginning there were two giants, uh, two orders of giants, frost giants and flame giants. And these two, uh, standing one group on each side of the great cleft in space, which is the Hindu egg of Brahma, or the great womb of Miru within which creation exists, these giants, one of flames and the other of ice, hurl their flames and their ice into the abyss. And out of the strugglings, out of the strivings, out of the torturings of fire and ice, striking together, vast steam arose, great mist came and covered the surface of creation. And out of the sub substance of this mist was fashioned the body of Ema, the Frost King, the first of all forms. And from his forms, from his form, the gods later fashioned the world. But in our, our more simple, less symbolic system, uh, the, the concept is simply that by this creation of duality, a space, a place, was set aside in eternity. And in that moment, time was born, dimensions were born, durations were set up, and the inevitable incarnation of the deity itself was decreed. In the course of time, the deity established its most important point. Out of the tremendous strivings of these two, fashioning uh, the egg, 
there was established a boundary. Boundary being the uh, the, uh, the area, uh, the allotment, as it was called, of space set aside for a solar system. Uh, this allotment of space in its own turn could vary. Some solar systems are much greater in size than others. But each of these is determined by the power of the creating uh, being that begins to incarnate. The greater the power of this being, the greater the area which is set aside for it. But in the end, this area is likened to a vast globe. This globe divides space into two kinds of space. The unconditioned on the outside, which remains forever the seminal field from which other worlds can come. And the conditions or, conditioned or circumscribed space within the sphere. This being now set aside and apart for the creation of a universe, or in this case a solar system. Uh, what we might more completely say would be that it is set aside as the potential body of the incarnating solar deity or solar logos. It is important to remember that in most of the ancient systems the circumference was established before the center. This is a little difficult for us to imagine. We think of a center of life radiating and that perhaps the extreme circumference of the radius would then become the area uh, of the egg. Actually, however, in the old systems it was held that the circumference came first, even as in the case of the embryo. Uh, that which was first under the wall of the cell ultimately becomes the complete covering of the human body, evolution taking place within this. Uh, and always this wall, uh, this ring pass knot, constituting uh, the circumference of the deity's space allotment. When this entire area has been permeated uh, with the energy which this being causes to flow into it, we now have a space condition in which there is an eternal life and we have a limited space allotment in which there is a non-eternal life force operating. Uh, this is uh, very important to, to try to rationalize this situation for it explains why in some of the older writings we are told that creation was accomplished by the gods gouging out holes in space and that these holes became solids that the, it was the opening or the empty area that became a world. What we are, I think, trying to, to distinguish here is uh, that the impregnation of uh, abstract space with the life of a deity places a restriction upon abstract space. It is no longer in its pure form. Abstract space has disappeared, so to say, into the composition of concrete space. And concrete space is mortal, durable, non-eternal. And concrete space upon which forms are to be created is less than the abstract space that preceded it. Therefore, in comparison to the original, it is more of a vacuum than a reality. Once this area, like an alchemical bottle in a laboratory experiment of some old chemist, once this material area has been set aside as a globe, a mysterious bubble floating in eternity, uh, then we find uh, the uh, thought that Plato gives us pretty clearly defined, where he says the Logos impresses itself upon creation in the form of the cross. In the beginning, the Logos certainly uh, impresses itself by assuming its position in relationship to this uh, sphere which is to be its incarnating vehicle. From the materials within this sphere, the body of, cre of the created solar system must be fashioned. And it must do be fashioned by drawing upon the resources uh, in the uh, part of space which has been allotted to a procedure. In that uh, point, then, according to Plato, the Logos impinges itself upon this sphere at the North Pole, 
that is at the upper extremity of the of the sphere and here it takes up its original and primary position from this point it begins the problem of create of uh, we would say conquering the field of its own manifestation and according to uh, Plato this is accomplished first by projection from uh, the pole of the now uh, in, uh, impregnated solar cell and this consists of these four lines of fission which first appear and which still also appear in development of the impregnated human ovum here we find the beginning of the creative process which is an infinite uh, fragmentation within this great sphere but the sphere itself is never divided we are also told therefore that this beginning this first place that arises in this sphere is the famous polar cap it is the mysterious lotus cup crown of the great solar parent when it incarnates it is also in terms of solar systems it is the imperishable island it is the place where the powers or deities first descend as in the story of the book of Enoch uh, this polar continent is again uh, mysteriously reflected downward through the various processes of creation until each planet has its polar continent and in turn each form of life has the equivalent to its polar continent including man for the polar continent in man is at the positive extremity of his magnetic field uh, being the upper part of the mysterious globe of energy which encloses him and is his miniature of the solar globe for the human being coming into incarnation first manifests by creating a globe of energy within which its body will develop by drawing upon the various resources of nature and the magnetic fields of its parents so this uh, imperishable island this uh, point which is the first to come and the last to go becomes the first link uh, between uh, the deity itself which is not embodied and the creation which it intends to fashion the creation must like the embryonic development of man reach a certain degree before it can be ensouled before it can be quickened by the descent of the Logos into the vehicle which it is building now in the ancient systems of mythology and in also in the oriental systems the deity awaking into objectivity which is reversing its polarity for actually in yoga and Vedanta we realize that the so-called awaking of the deity is actually its passing into the sleep of matter so that what we call awakening is only in terms of our own consciousness but in order to attain creation consciousness uh, the being has to sacrifice the eternal consciousness of the space samadhi itself that is the infinite uh, un unembodied consciousness the the samadhi the cosmic state of consciousness has to be lost in the process of creation it is submerged and the deity is beginning to submerge this consciousness in the area which is to set aside for creation as the deity awakens objectively by going to sleep subjectively the hierarchs which it has brought with it come into manifestation also in man according to the ancient belief seven spirits incarnate along with the sovereignty of the divine soul itself these spirits in man take up the seven vital functions of the body becoming symbolically represented in the body by the seven vital organs uh, is linked by the seven uh, units of the endocrine chain and finally by seven mysterious points in the brain which are called the Rishi or governors now the same thing happens in the development of the solar system the point at the north pole of the egg or of the magnetic field is the Miru or mountain of the gods 
and it is from here that all of the great creative processes take place. Incidentally, there is no correspondent southern pole, for all the growth moves from the positive. And in the uh, Hindu mythology, the suras are the great powers of light, work from the north pole. But the asuras, which are the negative principles of receptive darkness, work from the south pole. Uh, in the uh, development of this being, uh, those manifestations of its own consciousness, which are primary, first come into manifestation after itself. It gradually turns creation over to these secondary powers, for the only way that it can release them is to go to sleep in them. Therefore, uh, we have the great problem, which has uh, uh, oppressed theologians for thousands of years, and that is the Trinity, or the triad of creating powers in India, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Uh, in this particular symbolism, of course, as we know, uh, the supreme power goes to sleep as far as its unity is concerned and becomes aware of itself in its three creating aspects as a trinity. Uh, it has no longer the full conscious awareness of its own unity because this unity is absorbed into three uh, points of individualized consciousness. Uh, which constitute the triad or symbol of equilibrium. These three become the creative power, that is the power that is actually to become the beginning and ruler of all the processes of creativity. The second is to become the protective, the preservative, and the enlightening power. And the third is to become the reproductive and ultimately destructive power of crystallization or transformation, by means of which the entire pattern is prevented from ever being captured in an eternal likeness. In other words, the third power of your creator uh, is the power that prevents the ultimate turning of the solar system into stone and locking within it every form of life that is there. Therefore, as the processes of nature decline, then your disintegrating power breaks up the compounds. Uh, the creating power, of course, is Brahma, and in India, uh, the preserving, protecting, and perpetuating power is Vishnu, and uh, the power which breaks up crystallization by transformation is Shiva, the eternal mendicant, always dressed in uh, wild garments of an ascetic body, covered with clay, sitting alone in meditation on the snowy peaks of Himavat. The, the principle, however, is that three agencies now take over. And these three agencies, in taking over, in turn release those hierarchs or orders of life which are locked within their consciousness. And each one, as it unlocks uh, the powers within it, releasing orders of existence, goes to sleep in these orders of existence. Thus Vishnu, the preserver, in releasing the ten avatars, goes to sleep in the ten embodiments of itself. And all this process continues in which the continuous involutionary process, by means of which the solar system is finally brought into the condition which we might recognize today, is always a process of consciousness going to sleep in embodiment always a process of unities being broken up into diversities, always a process of a single consciousness uh, losing its nature of identity and becoming divided consciousness. So we finally reach the nadir of this situation, the greatest possible descent of the deity into manifestation. And at that point we have the universe of infinite diversity. We have the universe in which every fragment appears to be completely isolated, in which every substance and essence has its own life and its own purpose, in which there are infinite and countless manifestations of creatures and creations, uh, where uh, there is no longer any communion between these creatures, except perhaps such communion as comes through instinct or intuition. 
we have then the universe as or the solar system as we see it today. We have a solar system with countless forms of vegetation, with innumerable types of insects and fishes and birds, mammals of all kinds, flowers, trees. We have even the magnificent evolving processes in the crystallization of rocks. And we have perhaps above them all the mysterious power of man himself, who has also uh, a manifestation of this infinite division of consciousness. Now the ancients gave to the Trinity, or the basic creating triad of, of beings, uh, the power uh, to fashion out of the chaotic elements within the alchemical, alchemical vessel, uh, the great formula of life itself. And this process goes on, and the uh, medieval alchemists transform the entire creation of the universe, the solar system, man, and the human soul into chemical equations. And the study of all these equations is a very fascinating thing because it finally breaks down again to a highly evolved system of abstract philosophical chemistry. But for all practical purposes, we can't follow every step of the way. We know that as surely as the various powers emerge in their own development, uh, that we will find also the emergence of the planetary system. We find that from the sovereignty of the sun's consciousness will come forth the consciousness of planets. That these planets are miniatures of the solar system, each beginning with a magnetic field within the greater field each with its own Mount Nero at its northern pole, each therefore producing from itself a recapitulation of the seven continents, the seven uh, great uh, oceans, the seven orders of life, beginning with the mineral, and finally the seven basic races of men. All of these septenaries arise from the same septenary principle that brought forth the creation of the worlds in the first place. We have your musical harmony, your chemical affinities, and all these things paralleling this ancient system in every possible respect. We may later, as time goes on, be able to refine or improve some of the minor phases of it, but the great principle involved is not likely to be changed because man has never conceived anything since that was as stupendous and yet as logical in terms of common human experience as that which was developed by the sages of ancient India, Egypt, China, and Greece. These were the great thinkers of the primordial world of man's experience. So gradually this mysterious globe in space begins to fill. It fills in many ways. The Gnostics pointed out that gradually, as a result of this development, a new center was established. This new center, as it came into existence, uh, was necessary in order that the physical world might be generated. Uh, this center, like the original one, is not in dead center of the egg, but above the center, but not at the outer, uh, at top, as in the case of the prim primordial center. In man, three centers are recognized as coming into existence. The heart, or, uh, or spiritual core, and the brain and the reproductive system. These three become man's manifestation of the three deities. And in the creation of the solar system, these also come into manifestation. The next thing that we find is that near the center of this great circle or sphere that we have set up, there descends from above, from the imperishable center, a new or, ex or extension of life which moves into a central point and in this central point it draws from the entire area of the sphere all of the impregnated energy that is in a solar system is drawn from the circumference by a mysterious spiritual attraction until it gathers into a point near the center of the solar sphere or the or this a mysterious crystalline uh, bubble in which we uh, find the process taking place. Excuse my inadequacy in language, but some of these are rather taxing to find words for. In any event, 
the center having been established by privating, as Jacob Bamies calls it, privating the entire interior of the egg. Everything moves to the center to cause something that resembles the yolk of the egg. Uh, in the Greek, we have the same principle in the symbolism of the shield of Helios, the sun deity. The area of the circular sh uh, shield is the egg. Uh, the uh, central boss or knob represents the condensation of the spiritual power to a center. And as the uh, energy is all drawn to this center, what is left is called the privation. This is the part that is deprivated of life. This becomes what Bailey calls the great hunger. It is that which cries for life. It is told in the Gnostic series that the great mother cried out that she might give birth. And this great mother represents the field of the egg after it has been deprived by the central energy, which moves to the center and there forms by a tremendous psychic compression uh, the magnetic body of the sun. The sun, therefore, is the energy of the entire area set aside for a solar system. The sun becomes sovereign of that part which lies within the wall of the egg. Beyond the wall of the egg, the sun has no further sovereignty. And uh, outside of the solar system, beyond a certain point, the sun no longer exercises any uh, influence. It, uh, it may be seen, it may be it sends its own little ray across space, but it has no proprietorship over the evolutionary process. And if a ray of the sun or of some other sun in space uh, goes forth uh, like the ray of a fixed star which has been captured in sound and color by modern equipment, if this ray reaches out and maybe goes across a thousand solar systems to be recorded by some instrument that we have, this ray, however, does not fertilize. It does not cause any creation in this outside area, only within its own field of manifestation. Once the central sun is therefore uh, created, uh, we come again to the Pythagorean and Ptolemaic theory. In their theory, the egg of the solar system was represented by a circle within which were the concentric rings of the planetary orbits. But at this time, the planetary orbits do not exist. The time we are referring to, uh, the, the hypothetical boundary of the solar system is represented by a belt of stars. Inside of this, uh, the uh, material is gradually drawn to the center by privation. And to indicate that, the ancients established the orbits of the planets to signify the seven degrees of privation. Uh, the orbit of Saturn was fashioned first, being that which is the furthest from the sun. And therefore, Saturn is the eldest of the gods. And he is also the god that must destroy or devour all his own creation. His orbit being the most remote uh, represents, therefore, uh, that which is the first to be fashioned and, incidentally, will be the last uh, to be compensated or overcome. And uh, Milton says that death is the last great enemy. So that in the uh, development of this theory, uh, the orbits are formed by the retiring of the energy degree by degree toward center producing first the orbit of Saturn, then of Jupiter, then of Mars, then the ancient concept of the, or of the orbit of the Sun, which was, however, a cover for another planet which they did not know. And later, after that, the orbit of Venus and of Mercury and the orbit of the Moon, which was the closest to the Earth. They had their own little private system of astronomy, but the concept is that, that the Earth to them was the physical body corresponding to the human heart which was set up in the midst of the planets, and around which, in this case, the sun, as a superior energy, also rotated. But in any event, the Egyptians tell us that the uh, gathering of the seven degrees of substance 
uh, was from the circumference to the center, leaving the orbits like the concentric rings of an onion, which the Egyptians held to be a sacred vegetable because it revealed this mystery. When the energy had all reached the sun, uh, then, at that moment, uh, the physical structure of the solar system was born. At that time, all energy had been contracted, and in this energy field, the solar logos came into embodiment. It was then the quickening, and from that time on, the power of the solar principle was no longer operating from outside, from above, or with a conscious, separate understanding of the creative process. It then incarnated, according to the ancients, in the sun itself, and began the great evolutionary part of its existence. Having gathered all its resources to achieve birth, it now achieved maturity of embodiment by gradually releasing these resources into the vacuum that had been left by the retirement of energy in the first place. It therefore began to fill the privation around it with energy which had passed through and been conditioned by its own consciousness. And from this came the orbits and bodies of the planets as we know them, to become the embodiments of the seven Logoi, or the seven bowels, or the seven Elohim of the first chapter of Genesis who moved upon the face of the deep. Having gradually built all of this structure into a consistent pattern, uh, we find the solar logos gradually achieving maturity, producing what we might term today a structure in which the consciousness of the solar deity uh, became permeating throughout the entire area. From that time on, the solar deity gradually took hold of its own body as we do in growing up until finally the body became a complete agent for his purpose for the unfoldment of the various forms of life. Each form of life unfolded from a collective superior to itself. Thus, for instance, from a planetary deity unfolded all the life of the planet. Uh, from a particular uh, uh, group type or racial type or species type unfold all of the separate manifestations of the different kingdoms of nature. They are all emanations by a completely rational process. They are all perfectly ordered and ordained. Now the development of the solar system finally results in the emergence of a group of planets, all with their own evolving orders of life, all of them nourished by the one solar principle, all of them dependent upon solar consciousness for their consciousness, solar mind for their mind, solar emotion for their emotion, and solar energy for the preservation of their bodies. All of these energies are principles, only the body is a receptacle and not a principle. So all these various energies finally become embodied, and in so doing, gain ways of manifestation. When they are not embodied, they are not in manifestation. So man gains the power to perfect himself in arts and crafts and skills through the process of embodiment. And through this process, he learns the particular lesson of the great solar field of which he is a part for the solar power itself has impressed a purpose upon the entire procedure, and all creatures within that solar system are gradually moving to the fulfillment of that purpose. Now there is one other step in this which is intriguing and uh, a little more difficult perhaps, but uh, still worth making a try at in connection with this procedure. A man at various times in his own life experiences qualities or changes within his own nature. He finds, for example, uh, that under certain conditions he uh, is inclined uh, to attempt to improve his nature. He attempts to discipline himself. He attempts to gradually uh, integrate his own purposes. 
Now we have to realize that as man is born, grows up, passes through childhood, adolescence, and early maturity, and comes finally to the maximum use of his facilities, he still has something else he has to do. And that is he has to direct and dedicate his efforts to purposes that are proper and appropriate to him. Now in the solar procedure, something of this nature occurs. It is hard to uh, attempt to define it in such magnitudes as you would find in a solar system. But we still have the same principle involved. Namely that uh, the solar logos, or the creating power, uh, using uh, the entire solar system as its physical, emotional, vital, and mental organism, uh, becomes like the compound individual, a series of bodies, a series of factors and forces. We have solar mind, uh, and solar mind, while it is a great mind and an exalted mind, is not perfect mind. The same with all the other elements. A solar system in the great pattern of things is comparatively imperfect, and it is also even more imperfect when its ruling power has become obscured by the principles of matter. In other words, as it has descended into matter in a kind of symbolic fall, it has lost a certain amount of its own clarity, a certain amount of its own internal comprehension. It must regain this inner comprehension by means of a resurrection. And this resurrection, which is the raising of the dead, is nothing more or less than the release of consciousness from the sepulcher uh, of matter, or of uh, ignorance, of form, of the vibratory pattern which has closed in and limited or reduced the effectiveness of life itself. Now, resurrection being the restoration of consciousness simply means the restoring of the total consciousness of the solar being and the equivalent in the solar being to what we would term illumination. In other words, this being restored to its own nature, restored to its own full consciousness, attains illumination, a, a symbolism which we find beautifully developed in the northern system of Buddhism. Here we recognize that the great powers, the um, uh, Dhyana Buddhas particularly, also pass into samadhi or pass into a state of meditation. And in this state of meditation, they also achieve a little, an illumination. That there has to be also the awakening of the solar deity itself. This awakening is due in part to the production in nature of forms capable of releasing the higher forms of solar consciousness. Man at the present time is regarded as the creature possessing the most immediate resources for the liberation and restoration of the solar consciousness. This becomes therefore part of the secret rituals of the ancient mystery rites, namely that the dying God dies in man, and that the resurrection takes place by the release of solar consciousness through man. That as fast as this consciousness is released, it is available again to the total experience, and that through this uh, mysterious procedure, the solar being awakens, passing from its own kind of ignorance to its own kind of total enlightenment for itself. In order to achieve this, the solar being subjects its various bodies to discipline. And this is a very interesting point. Uh, just as man, uh, seeking enlightenment or seeking to advance in spiritual insight, must impose certain rules and regulations upon himself for the advancement of his own character and the perfection thereof. So, according to the ancient philosophies, the solar logos, having become embodied, having entered into the chaos of infinite potential, having been immersed or drowned or died in matter, uh, as its consciousness unfolds, 
by evolution, just as man's consciousness unfolds by the evolutionary process, it reaches the point in its development in which it recognizes the necessity of imposing self-rulership upon self. This experience, of course, is discovered, as Buddha points out, very largely to the Logos by man himself. Man is the one who experiences God's need for discipline. He is the one that realizes in mysterious way that by discipline or by the integration of his resources, uh, he grows or becomes greater, or his consciousness is subject to illumination. This illumination of consciousness is a release, actually, not of man's consciousness, which is only a fragment of the solar consciousness, but the release of the solar consciousness itself. Thus, every being that arrives at illumination releases a part of the solar consciousness. And the bodhisattvas, who will not accept the nirvana until the least of all creatures is illumined, represents the consciousness or realization uh, that the perfection of the great de being or deity who projected the world is achieved only when every creature in it attains liberation. When that is attained, then the being itself is liberated. Then the uh, mysterious Prometheus who was crucified for bringing light to man is released from the rocky crag of Mount uh, Caucasus. Then and then only uh, is the resurrection of the Logos achieved. Then only is the restoration of the Golden Age made possible. To attain this, therefore, what, what, what happens? The individual going out in life seeks teaching, seeks help, and finds that something has been seeking him at the same time. This thing that has been seeking him is the great order of world saviors. These order, this order of world saviors represents the release from within the solar deity of the powers of enlightenment which were also locked within it. For as Buddhism points out, when the great uh, being went to sleep in the previous embodiment, it took into sleep with it the dedicated sages. It took into sleep with it uh, the arhats, the ones who must guard the world during the intervals between Buddhas. It took into sleep with it the bodhisattvas and the liberated ones, the dedicated ones, and also uh, the great Buddhas of compassion. These were the spiritual force, the moral character, uh, the insight of the solar logos. And when it began to emerge and unfold again here, uh, when a certain degree of evolution was attained in the structure of the solar system, these various orders of sages began to embody also. These teachers that had uh, also slept in rest in the divine mind until a certain point of evolution was accomplished uh, were released by the fact that it was then proper for man to be able to comprehend them as unfolding mind in the solar system became capable of understanding that which was necessary for that mind to understand was released from the divine mind. And this process kept on and keeps on continuously. For within the hierarchy of the solar logos must rest all of the forces and powers actually required to achieve the ultimate liberation of the logos. If such were not the case, then the power of crystallization would take over and we would have dead ends. We would have things that can never go anywhere. But always in the divine nature there can be no dead end. For that which is uh, actually the solar consciousness in its fullness is capable at all times of absolutely controlling or determining the ends of its own creation process. But this controlling power is not available uh, at all times. It is not available until it is released gradually through the evolution of creatures. But this evolution is inevitable. 
Therefore, as time goes on, the problems get more complicated because faculties and natures become more complicated. But always with this complication, the faculties become richer in their power to comprehend and more to comprehend is released in the form of the incarnation of these hierarchs of teachers. So that actually uh, the government of the solar system is entrusted uh, really to three forces. It is uh, entrusted to three powers which are expressions of the consciousness of the Logos. It is entrusted first uh, to the Manus, the great lawgivers. The lawgivers being the exactitude of the solar mind. The solar mind in the beginning when it first contemplated absorption into creation, trusted its entire future upon the laws. These laws were a mysterious network of inevitables. These inevitables extended throughout all space, far beyond solar systems and galaxies and cosmic orders. These laws were the very laws of the substances of space which consciousness must work with. Therefore, when the great power went to sleep, it went to sleep in the law. It went to sleep with the perfect certainty that the tides of eternity would bring it finally back again to its natural estate. Uh, there could be no doubt of this. It had absolute and complete faith because this faith was grounded in these eternal principles. And to these eternal principles it, it, it turned over the administration of itself during its ages of sleep. And these principles became its unconscious leaders. They became its inevitable will guardians. They were the, the will powers of deity. And these were the great and inevitable law givers. Then the second uh, order of protection uh, that was given was what has been called the Lords of the Heart Doctrine. Uh, the Lords of the Heart Doctrine represented the entire gamut of human idealistic conception. All religions, all ideals, all hopes, all faiths, all beauties, all of the great creative arts, everything that inevitably must lead uh, to the perfection of human insight in terms of faith and adoration, beauty, veneration, respect. All of these powers were invested in the Lords of the Heart Doctrine, who were the ones that became the shepherds of men. They were the ones who had to uh, administer love before there were hearts to feel it. They were the ones who had to bring out of the growth of things in their strivings and their struggles and in the, in the terrible chemistries of space had to finally bring forth natural and kindly regards. From them also came the great patient teachers of human benevolence, the saints and the martyrs, all who gave all of themselves by an instinct which they cannot completely rationalize uh, to the service of mankind. But all such dedicated persons are actually seed lives that were carried over by the Logos at the time it took on embodiment. They were not all fashioned here, but some were fashioned here. And in Buddhism they are differentiated into two orders, therefore, the celestial bodhisattvas and the terrestrial bodhisattvas. The celestial bodhisattvas are the teachers that were brought over from the previous cycle. The terrestrial bodhisattvas, the dedicated disciples who rose here to carry on the work of these teachers. And these two orders work together. As soon as the terrestrial powers or bodhisattvas become strong enough, the celestial ones will retire from operation. But only when the world is able psychically, emotionally, and spiritually, and aesthetically, and culturally to sustain itself. Uh, the third order of the protectors and so forth were the basis of the scientific and civil administrative powers of mankind. Uh, like the saints and the seers, uh, these also were carried over. There are orders of intellects 
that were derived from other patterns of life, such as the great philosophers, also the great scientists. And one of the reasons why in evolution we pass from one age to another is because as we evolve, waves of life that have been held in suspension until the environment for them was appropriate come in and contribute their part to the direction of the entire pattern. This coming in of lives that have previously not been present merely means a calling upon other resources within the nature of the solar power itself. All of these principles are within that solar power. All of them were tied into the creation process by the impregnation of space within the sphere of solar creation. All of them were parts of the solar nature, just as all energies in life are part of the wealth which we receive from the sun. And as the symbolism of the sun shows nourishment to all things according to their needs, so these sun nourishment principles uh, become embodied as the various deities of the ancient pantheons and the ancient philosophical systems. This is the reason for the elaborate structure of the Shingong Mandaras in Japanese Buddhism. These thousands of deities, and in some instances tens of thousands of deities, all represent nothing but the individualization of the energy of the sun. They are all manifestations of some quality of Dainichi Nyori or the great Buddha Virakana. Uh, actually, therefore, just as every color that we see comes from the sun's light, just as every f uh, flavor that we can taste, every odor that we smell, everything that we touch is only a form of sun energy or sun structure. So actually, according to the, this philosophy, uh, these germinal rays of the sun, forever pouring into the abyss or the vacuum to fill it, uh, will be represented by not only faculties or powers or circumstances or growths, but also as spiritual living beings. Uh, they represent uh, the creative energies as specialized uh, beings. In the uh, ancient system, there was no energy that was not embodied in something. Uh, there was no uh, mere electricity flying through space from the sun to some human being or to some other structure. All this energy was in the form of hierarchs. It was the fo in the form of evolving lives that were the particular channels of this energy. And these evolving lives brought the energies into manifestation with them hold them in manifestation and finally when their purposes are finished these energies are withdrawn and these hierarchies retire again into the eternal nature. Uh, in the illumination of Buddha uh, we find the symbolism of the great teacher surrounded by the hierarchs. We find him in the presence of all the Buddhas of previous cycles. We find him attended by celestial beings. And in the Lotus of the Law, which is the great Mahayana scripture, we find uh, an audience composed even of friendly and kindly associates who for the great enlightenment have come in from other solar systems to be present, not to interfere, but to rejoice in the fact that a great circumstance is occurring in nature, uh, that a great power is being released in the evolution of things and these gatherings for the release of great good may be considered sort of solar or cosmic holidays. They are days when all the universe rejoices in as much as another phase of the great consciousness of Dainichi Niori has been released into manifestation. When all this evolutionary process has reached a certain degree of unfoldment, little by little all lives begin to flow back again into the consciousness of the cause. Their, their outflowing was to lose consciousness, 
to become unaware of their source, therefore to wander in darkness until the life and character in themselves, longing for reunion with reality, impel them to begin the arduous journey to self-enlightenment. But in the great motion back, uh, motion back in evolution in the solar system is simply a continuous process of awaking. It is a process of uh, lives becoming more and more conscious of realities. And that's the highest solar reality is the Logos, or the power at the source of solar existence. As all the parts of the solar system become aware of this, they return to it, which is, of course, underlying the Buddhist concept of the Paranirvana. For the Paranirvana is simply the hierarchies returning home uh, to the great spiritual orders to which they belonged, as we also see in the magnificent spectacle of the hierarchs on the petals of the great rose in Dante's Paradiso. Actually, all these hierarchies returning home restore the consciousness of the solar logos uh, in Shingong Dainichi Niori. When they have all come back, when all divided consciousness has experienced again unity, when all divided parts have been drawn together in the indissolvable bonds of insight, the uh, energies slowly become again what they were in the beginning. They retire from the many to the twelve, from the twelve to the seven, the seven to the three, and the three return again to the one. And when they have all returned again to the one, the solar system has completed a lifetime. At that time, having regained its consciousness, enriched by the tremendous pageantry of growth which has occurred within it during its cycle, the solar logos awakens from embodiment. It is released from body as man is released from body. But as man, according to the ancient mysteries, uh, may be released in two ways. Uh, we have the same principle involved in this. Uh, there is a form of death in which uh, the body is separated from the soul. And there is also a form of death in which the soul rising separates itself from the body. And in the philosophical mysteries, the return of these conscious powers under the dedication of discipline, uh, the tr transformation of, of men and creatures into avatars, into ahats, into sages. Uh, all this means the gradual return of life as consciousness becoming more and more aware both of itself and of its great overlife. Finally, they all come together again in the consciousness of Dainichi. Then the globe and all that it inhabit disappears. Uh, then the rings go back. Everything slowly reverses itself until nothing remains again but the imperishable island floating upon the surface of unconditioned space. Then at last this perishable, imperishable island does not perish but vanishes into subjectivity where it remains until the next cycle of embodiment is, is proper and natural. The Logos then goes to sleep again for the seven eternities. This is going on constantly in space, according to the ancients. Uh, in Buddhist philosophy, the Buddhas and the great uh, principles, the spiritual powers of tens of thousands of myriads of universes uh, attend in the great rejoicing when one of the solar systems is completed and one of these great cycles comes to an end. But this cycle again is of course part of a larger one. The solar deity in passing into sleep contributes uh, to the evolution of the universal deity around whose nature many solar systems rotate. And the universal deity in turn with all its uh, solar systems uh, and all its parts is part of a galaxy or a still greater pattern which again is reaffirming itself. But as all these things are continually reaffirming, the ancients held uh, that in the ultimate or in the final nature of things, which is utterly uh, beyond our conception, inconceivable to us, 
that everything consists finally of evolution causing things to wake up and that ultimately uh, the total experience of everything is therefore to be uh, total, to be aware, to wake up and in this awaking to wake up as infinity to wake up as pure divine consciousness to wake up as the administrator or the ruler of the great sea of space and after having awakened to take on again in some way the dream of illusion in order to advance other areas, other factors for as surely as illumination is eternal and inevitable so that those elements or patterns which are created are likewise eternal and innumerable and we have to also realize that at various stages in this procedure living things themselves become seminal that is they become uh, seeds and at certain periods of their development the creatures of the various hierarchies bring new waves of life or new sparks of life into manifestation which must go through the great cycle in space we may agree with the Brahmins and we may agree with the Buddhists that it's all very abstract we must agree with them that we do not have the answers to the infinites but I think it is interesting to conceive as far as we can go the majesty of this concept a concept which it seems to me by some mysterious and wonderful grasp of insight transcends the noblest and most extravagant fantasies of science transcends anything that we can imagine for it not only gives us this infinite majesty of purpose it gives us the infinite scientific unfoldment of things under law and under consciousness uh, but it also preserves a tremendous pattern of divine purposes of great spiritual beings and great spiritual centers of consciousness constantly and inevitably fulfilling their proper destinies in space it is a very large concept naturally it, we cannot grasp it all but the small fragment that has been grasped has become the basis of most of the world's enlightened philosophies and has stood the test of human experience uh, better than any system upon a less substantial foundation and so with this perhaps as a basis we have we can proceed to further phases of the ancient concepts of creation as they are found in the old teachings well I think that's enough for this evening and thank you very much it is not even imaginable by us consequently we cannot define this nature we can only accept uh, in terms of thoughts or in terms of words that there is this unconditioned eternal and that in some mysterious way this is the cause that existence as we know it can exist that existence can exist only because life exists and life itself is one of the basic manifestations of space of eternity and it causes from its own nature all the living things that are dependent upon life for their existence so we can either consider the ancient writings of the Zohar the Kabbalah of the early Jews or the ancient Vedic writings and the and particularly the Puranas of the Hindus or the Yigin, the classic of change the ancient book of China or any one of many other uh, early records they all seemingly have admitted the same essential principle that there was an eternity and that this eternity is the principle which peoples and nations have gradually come to identify as God God therefore is primarily abstractly the mysterious unity of eternal life uh, deity is the one that permeates all it is the one undifferentiated it is that which is one in sense of total unity and from this inevitable and ineffable source all things originate now this would cause naturally a consideration of what the gnosis 
and the Kabbalists call the doctrine of emanations. Here we have something that goes on like a great ocean, a Tao in China. Here is the great sea, the inevitable. Uh, we watch it in our mind's eye because we cannot see it. But we can imagine it as though it were a vast ocean extending through all eternity. And it is quiet, and it seems to be unmoved. And yet somewhere in the apparently transparent depths of it, uh, there have to be things, seeds, lives, principles, energies, essences. And these are capable of coming forth uh, out of this uh, procedure under certain conditions. We then come to the problem of conditions. And this again forces us back into the idea of how it all started. How did this eternal potential uh, suddenly uh, dynamically come to generate? How did this sea, which is forever itself, suddenly cause something to arise within it, which seems to be a diminution of itself? Uh, two principles are involved in the solution to this. The first is uh, that this vast ocean of ever existing, the only answer that seems to be possible is therefore that it was ever existing. For it is almost inconceivable to man to imagine God growing up from a small child. Uh, we are confronted then with deity as an unknowable value, an in inevitable and ultimate uh, value beyond which we cannot go. What uh, constitutes the nature of the divine? What is the basic power of the divine consciousness? Uh, theologians do not like to uh, discuss. It gets to be too complicated, and we are not in the presence of any satisfactory uh, formal knowledge which can withstand the debates of opposing opinions. The second theory or, uh, or philosophy that has been fashioned simply, frankly, assumes that what, what we might term the infinite essence or infinite nature of things is by its own quality and principle eternal. That everything that exists is in essence eternal, and that what we call creation is merely a manifestation, a conditioned existence arising within an eternal nature. According to this concept, creation is not the result of the dictum of an arbitrary or separate deity. Creation is a manifestation of principles that are inherent within existence itself existence being eternal and inevitable. Uh, this attitude, this conviction, I think, held most of the better minds of the past. That at the beginning root or substance of all conditioned existence, as we can imagine it, whether of human beings or of suns or of solar systems or of galaxies or of cosmic chains, even of space itself, at the root and source of all of this, is essence, an unconditioned nature of itself, capable of manifesting condition, but always containing within its own ineffable principle all that can be manifested from it. Thus we may say that existence moves into the production of existences, and these existences return again to existence which continues. Uh, it was interesting to realize that some rather ancient peoples, uh, long before the benefits of knowledge as we have them today, were able to conceive of this total existence, to conceive that it transcended time, that time was merely an expression of it, that it, ex uh, it transcended space, space was only a manifestation of it, and that there exists somewhere, everywhere, in the innermost and outermost parts of all things, and in all the intervals between the innermost and the outermost, one indivisible essence, one indivisible being, and that this continues
There comes a time in the development of every family when the children begin to ask questions. And one of the questions that can be looked forward to with some apprehension is the inevitable one, where did I come from? The family braces for this, and according to its own insight and its estimation of the intelligence of the child, attempts to explain the origin of life. First of all, of course, the child has asked, where did I come from? This is always overlooked, for there is no ready and available answer. The parents, if they are modern and feel that they cannot expose their children to legendary, uh, attempt a simple statement of biology. Uh, the best they can possibly hope to accomplish with or without the aid of the birds and the bees is a description of some kind relative to the origin of the physical body of that child. Because the youngster has no particular point in mind when he asks the question, usually merely interested in larger generalities, uh, the child does not normally question further. He accepts an answer that is obviously inadequate because he has no way of estimating adequacy. The matter then rests for a time and may not be brought up again for 50 or 60 years. The information that has been provided is regarded as gospel, and later various courses in school and college support this position. But our remote ancestors, back in the days when they were trying to orient themselves in this universe in which we live, were a little more thoughtful and a little more idealistic in their approach to this large issue. In order to understand where we come from, we have to find out where the world came from. We have to understand the entire process of creation itself. For only against the background of a great universal law or pattern can the development of individual forms of life be properly considered. From the most ancient times, therefore, we may say that concepts concerning the origin of things the origin of existence itself, divided into two general patterns. These patterns have descended to us in philosophy, religion, doing forever, is the base material, the earth in which creation grows. And the creation itself is merely a continuing process in which the potentials of this infinite existence uh, are gradually transformed into potencies or manifestations. Today, I believe the tendency is to assume this general concept. In the uh, development of this concept, of course, many systems of philosophy lost sight of the idea of an ultimate deity. They lost sight of the concept of one conscious being at the source of life. Rather, they thought of an eternal being, all conscious, always. And that consciousness as we know it is as much a conditioned state of universal consciousness as bodies as we know them are conditioned state of, states of universal substance. Uh, this uh, general attitude uh, seemed to provide the best foundation for the creation of a philosophic system. For systems have to be born just as beings are born, out of a primary conviction. And the primary conviction becomes the essence of that doctrine or that philosophy, which merely expands and extends it. We may term the primary conviction a premise or an hypothesis, but upon it must be built all uh, that follows after it 
in terms of the detailed explanation of the processes of creation. Out of the general opinion and uh, substance of many ancient systems, we can gain a certain basic idea of the uh, beginnings of human thought in these matters. In both East and West, in the most ancient cultural concepts, we find, therefore, that, so to say, in the beginning or from the beginning or however we want to call it, throughout eternity, from that which has no beginning or end as we know it, but beginning now in the sense of fundamental, basic, uh, that which is the source of all else, that in this kind of a beginning there was an infinite essence, infinitely diversified, spreading through all time and space as a great principle of life, that this life principle transformed what might be termed vacuum into a dynamic space area or field. This field is limitless, eternal, inevitable. And it extends not only beyond the stars as we see them, but beyond all creations of all kinds, beyond even our imagination. This is one potency, one tremendous dynamic. And this dynamic is invisible to us, beyond our comprehension, has no form or shadow by which we can see it, and in its natural and inevitable science, and we are still clinging to some aspect of this ancient thinking, although we have attempted to enlarge and deepen our understanding. There are only two ways in which you can answer the question of first cause. One is to take the attitude that there was a beginning of some kind. No matter how you try to work with this situation, it is embarrassing. Uh, if, for example, you imagine the child asking questions to be a little older and a little wiser, and you tell that child that he came from his parents, then the next question would be, where did the parents come from? They came from their parents, and so on by regression to an inevitable point of uncertainty. Where did the primordial, original, first parents come from? This question is still not answered, and uh, is not likely to be, except by further uh, regression of thinking. Some scientists might point out that we came from the anthropoids. Then the question is, where did the anthropoids come from? Then we can go back through all the different forms of life to a monocellular organism sometime in the dawn of things, but we're still burdened with the question, where did that come from? Therefore, all questions concerning beginning uh, have to be approached non-logically. You, you cannot possibly uh, develop a, a logical sequence that will include the origin of first cause. The uh, theological approach to this in several different areas has been to assume that creation was created by a divine being. This is probably the ultimate theological regression. It is as far back as even the most pious-minded can think. We must then assume that apart from creation, there was a creator and that for some reason, at a certain time, long ago, or not so long ago, according to the denomination you belong to, uh, this creator caused by his own will or by the verbum, the speaking of the ineffable word, uh, to uh, cause the world to come forth. Here we have then a creator separate from creation, ordaining it, creating it, fashioning it, uh, dominating, governing, and ruling it, and planning its progress over a period of time. Obviously, this pattern nearly always includes an ultimate dissolution of this world. It returns at some infinite time in the future to the unknowable being from which it came. 
We seem to have a rather neat package here, except for one difficulty. Where did God come from? What was the nature of this being? Uh, was this being 